morning everybody this morning i'd like to share a chapter from this fabulous book this is the victory written by leslie weatherhead it was printed in 1940 and leslie became a methodist minister in 1915. he wrote this book to help and guide people who were experiencing the second world war he served in manchester in leeds and also in london he was a brilliant preacher and many of his sermons are in print and he was uh, president of Methodist Conference as well in 1955. He died in 1976 and I was just one. So this is chapter nine and it's entitled Greeting. I expect many of my readers wake up in the morning and for 10 seconds feel glad to be alive. The sunshine is streaming through the window and the birds are at matins. Then the mind is troubled by a sudden query, what is wrong? And in the tenth of a second comes the answer, of course the war. And the old darkness falls upon the spirit for the rest of the day until, if we are lucky, the nightly miracle of sleep wafts us away to a dreamland where not even the horror of war follows us. In writing this, I do not mean, of course, that the darkness of the spirit is unbroken. We have our routine work to do. Humour will keep breaking through. We try to keep bright. We hide our fears and our depression. Yet for most of us, just below the threshold of mind's consciousness lies a vast sea of anxiety and a heavy deluge of bad news. It's enough to raise the water level and flood our hearts and minds with distress. We must find ways of escape. The mind cannot be kept in good health if it's not at times encouraged to breathe an ampler, purer air. The mind kept constantly on the stretch begins to lose its power of resilience. Let me urge you to attempt at least a mental escape and support my plea by showing what escape has meant to others. For temporary escape to things that are of God makes faith in him more easy and gives the mind a chance to regain its tone. One day a friend of mine told the story. He was with a friend and they were sharing together. The story unfolded and it was an ugly and a depressing one they were talking about plots and counterplots, poverty and vice. And when the story was finished, a kind of resilience of horror and depression fell on those two friends sharing stories. And then one of them pointed to a bowl of lovely roses on his table and said to his friend, plunge your face in those roses and thank God. One is reminded of Tertullian's great saying, if I give you a rose, you won't doubt God any more. For indeed, an offering of beauty to the grown man is quite different from the act of giving a child a pretty toy or a sweet. It is to present to the thoughtful mind an argument which runs roughly as follows. The heart that planned what you call beauty cannot be hostile or cruel or beastly. And your ability to appreciate and love beauty means there is a kinship between you and the reality which beauty reveals. Rest your mind then, not only in any form of beauty which appeals to you, but in the truth of the God behind it. Nothing can destroy beauty or your apprehension of it. War and ugliness, horror and beastliness will pass. Beauty is one of the eternal values and abides. And having rested in beauty for a time, you will go back with deeper dedication and greater energy and strength to combat evil. You will work the harder to make the world a place where all men and women can be happy and all things come into harmony with the eternal mind, with God. All beauty does this for us. Music, for example. A musician who was singing just after the start of the First World War said this. 
I love Handel's music and it does me good. Europe is in a most terrible trouble. It's never known such trouble in civilised times and no one can say what will be left at the end. But Handel's music will survive. A lady writes of the great beauty of literature in which you can escape. She tells the time of when she went into her husband's dressing room and found him reading Our Mutual Friend. She writes, he told me he was going to read all the Dickens novels as they removed his thoughts, if only for a short time, from colleagues and allies. Art has the same spell for some. One of my friends, when he went to lecture in another town, used to take a copy of some famous picture and put it in his hotel room by his bed. And he would just look at it, his body completely relaxed, because, he said, its beauty refreshed and renewed his spirit. There is another aspect of beauty which I would recommend as mental escape from the depression that war sets up. I mean the beauty of victorious living. I find in myself a new and keen love for great biographies. They give me back victorious faith. We all long for ease and comfort, a release from the need for courage and sacrifice. Yet the very thing that helps us most in great biography is the account of the way in which great men and women face difficulty and hardship and refuse to surrender to the evil things or the ugly things. Even the memory of beauty can heal the spirit. Canon Charles Raven, in his book, In Praise of Birds, wrote concerning the last war. From the restless horror and hideousness of the war zone, I could slip away to the imagined wonder of wave-washed rocks and the clamour of the sea fowl and the eggs lying bare. So if it's not too much, I would offer advice. Before winter sets in or another week drags on, make the most attractive appeal to you. Decide what forms of beauty does this. It may be the loveliness of nature, the dreaming moors, the mountains, the mysterious woods. Your particular escape may be in the delight of studying birds or flowers or rocks or insects. It may be that you have never discovered the new world which music opens up, or art, or literature. I am told that anthologies of poetry are selling as never sold before. What plans to read Dickens or Scott through again? To read the life of Mozart, to study and hear his music? to read a dozen books on birds or rocks and wander in the countryside or in the woods. But let me write a few lines of warning about ways of escape. Those I have mentioned are tonics in my view because they take the mind back through beauty to the really lasting values and the presence of God. But let's be careful. Some methods of escape are not tonics. We've all heard of the man who excused his drunkenness to a Manchester magistrate by saying it was the quickest way out of Manchester. And we've learned of the escape which the betting fever produces too. Such a means is not a tonic but a drug. The palate is jaded, not delighted. Perhaps the test lies just there as to whether a means of escape is a tonic or a drug. We need to be careful. Let me plead for a place for God. Prayer sounds to many a dull, stuffy thing. It's a tragedy that that is so, for watching birds or reading poetry can be a form of prayer. Prayer is communion with God, that rather than merely asking for things, it's allowing oneself to be caught up in the life and the purposes of God. Prayer, of course, has many aspects and our petitions for ourselves and intercessions for others are bound to take war into account. But I think prayer should contain the kind of thankful adoration 
which lifts the heart high above all world worries and heart cares to the serene, eternal life of God enthroned and the ultimate beauty where truth and goodness are one. He then goes on to say this. We have seen a vision of the eternal and know it will become true. So the Christ made escape again and again to the mountains and then came back from that strengthened to glimpse the city of God's purpose to work in the foul slums of man's greed. He was transfigured on a high mountain where again he breathed the air of the spiritual world. He descended to cure an epileptic boy. He wept over men's sorrows, but not in sentimental escapism, for he died for our sins. Religion that was mere escapism, making people run from reality into dream pictures of wishful thinking, would stand condemned. But religion that goes to God, goes to God, that takes people to look at the eternal beauty, that strengthens and inspires, that replaces men's ugliness with real beauty, religion that draws the mind away to breathe the air of heaven just for a while, is wonderful. By such a process, faith recovers its perspective, restores its poise and balance, renews its health, returns to life with greater will to victory. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So may we all breathe the air of heaven and know that this is the victory. Please get this book if you can. You will never, ever regret it. Have a good day. Take care.